Ooh. Can you see that behind me? You check that out? Do you know what that is? That is a watchtower, a small one, where watchmen for the House of Israel would stand and defend the defenseless here in this land. Uh, let's go check it out. Now, I want to tell you, as we're climbing up here, that Israel had a very interesting week. I mean, our week right now, uh, we remember the Yom Kippur War. Ooh, the Yom, the Yom Kippur War. Uh, you can see how, oh, there's a little birdie there. I said, shalom. The Yom Kippur War was a war where uh, we thought we were going to completely die. I mean, we were completely, and you can see how this thing can turn. You see how it how it rotates and how you can actually um, uh, point out of any different window and you can defend uh, this land. Now let me tell you one thing. Come out here with me. You see where you can mount a machine gun? Yeah, so let me really fast tell you that this week we remember the miracle that God did to defend Israel. He never slumbers nor sleeps who watches over Israel. He watched over Israel and this week we remember that war where we thought we would never survive. Let me tell you about it briefly. Imagine you're a pioneer on the border of Israel and you find out that armies are amassing to destroy this whole fledgling state. It was called the Yom Kippur War. Some call it the 1973 Arab-Israeli War or the Fourth Arab-Israeli War. It was an armed conflict from the 6th to the 25th of October. So right now, in 1973, a coalition of Arab states was formed, led by Egypt and Syria, to completely destroy Israel. The majority of the combat between the two sides took place in the Sinai Peninsula and in the Golan Heights of Israel, where my brother Moshe lives. Both the Sinai and, of course, the Golan Heights came into the stewardship of Israel in 1967 in the Six Day War, not long before this time. Egypt's initial objective in the war was to seize a foothold on the eastern bank of the Suez Canal and subsequently leverage these gains to negotiate the return of the rest of what was called Israeli-occupied Sinai. Where it began, you have the Nesher team, you have the Mirage V fighter jets flying over the Golan Heights, you have uh, over the Sinai Peninsula, you know, Israeli planes flying. You see an, a mass of troops and already there's an evacuation of wounded personnel. Egyptian forces occupy the eastern bank of the Suez Canal with the exception of the Israeli crossing point near the Dever Sor Air Base. Israeli forces occupy 1,600 kilometers square of territory on the southwestern coast of the Suez Canal within 100 kilometers of the capital of Egypt, Cairo, and we end up encircling the Egyptian Third Army on the eastern banks of the Suez Canal, which everyone thought was impossible. We also were able to defend 500 square miles of the Bashan Syrian region at the top of the Golan Heights, right where the Valley of Tears is, and advance within 30 kilometers of Damascus, Syria. So we had Israel against Egypt, Syria, Saudi Arabia, Algeria, Jordan, Iraq, Libya, Kuwait, Tunisia, Morocco, Cuba, Sudan, supported by the Soviet Union, East Germany at the time, North Korea and Pakistan. Egypt had about 800,000 troops, 1,700 tanks, uh, 2,400 armored carriers, 1,120 artillery units, 400 combat aircraft, 140 helicopters, 104 naval vessels, 150 surface-to-air missile batteries right on the front lines. Syria had something like 150,000 troops, 100... 1,200 tanks, about 900 armored carriers, 600 artillery units, um, missionary forces from all over of 100,000 troops, about 670 tanks, 700 armored carriers. Cuba sent tank brigades. Morocco sent, what, five and a half thousand troops, 30 tanks, 52 combat aircraft. Saudi Arabia sent 3,000 troops. There was about over a million troops total, about 4,000 armored carriers, about 4,000 tanks. Uh, we were very, very outnumbered. When you just look at... 140 helicopters, 104 naval vessels, 150 surface-to-air missile batteries. You can imagine that it was our holiest day. Everyone's fasting. It's called Yom Kippur. And some of you celebrated Yom Kippur with us. You know that everyone's in their homes and in their, in, in their synagogues. There's no driving, uh, you know. And so you had at the same time the, the month of, of Ramadan. You have the unity of the enemies of Israel coming together to obliterate Israel once and for all. 
Of course, we know that the United States and the Soviet Union at the time were very, very much at odds. And each side is considering, should we arm this part of the conflict or that part of the conflict? The war had such a turning point, a, a commencing, a culmination point with the massive successful crossing of the sons of Israel as we crossed the Suez Canal. Now that's our unit, the Combat Engineer Corps. We crossed over on these floating things that we made, these floating bridges, surprising everyone. And Egypt's third army was caught off guard and cut off. Israel surrounded Egypt's third army. Just saying it sounds just so amazing. Immobilizing them, cutting them off from the rest of, of the Egyptian um, forces. The Syrians and the Egyptians also came in so strong on, from both sides, we felt we would never ever survive. After three days of heavy fighting, Israeli forces had pushed the Syrians back to the pre-war ceasefire lines, and the Israeli military then launched a four-day offensive, counter-offensive, deep into Syria. Within a week, we were right on the outskirts of Damascus. And in Egypt, after a few weeks, we were almost at Cairo. You know, after the 1967 Six-Day War, people were so in such euphoria about the army and about the success in six days to defend Israel that people even started calling their children army or Sahal. That was a name. People were so trusting in the army. And then when this Yom Kippur 1973 war happened and we all were this close to being completely wiped out as a nation, as a land, I think people started to once again say we can trust in no one but God. Although there were great tactical successes which happened on the Israeli side, there was, there was a doubt that we would ever be able to hold the land, to hold on to this much territory as we'd done in the first, second, and third uh, Arab-Israeli conflicts. Uh, and eventually when this uh, Israeli-Palestinian peace process began in the 1978 Camp David Accords that followed the war, uh, for some reason, we decided to give the entire oil-rich Sinai Peninsula back to Egypt. Of course, later in the 1979 Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty, we saw this man Anwar Sadat come at the risk of his own life to make peace with Rabin. Of course, both of them were assassinated by their own people. Egypt continued to drift farther and farther away from Soviet control and that peace marked more of a westernization in Egypt, you know, alongside Israel. Of course, the Golan Heights is safely and securely in the hands of those stewards that God asked to steward the Jewish people. And just like in the times of the Bible, once again, vines are springing up. I can only imagine what would have happened though with the Sinai if we had not given it back to the Muslims, the beaches there, the coral reefs, the oil rich territory. I gotta wonder, hey, did God give it to us supernaturally because he wanted us to steward that jointly with the Egyptians and to begin that prophecy found in Isaiah 19? Uh, I don't know. But the future is still being written as you and I follow the King of Kings. Thank you for taking this time to briefly remember the miracles that happened in 1973, the Yom Kippur Day of Atonement War.